while you're turning to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, let me just again remind you that I'm preaching through a series of messages that I've entitled The Bedrock of Baptist Belief. Inside of your bulletin, you'll find an outline of the message this morning. I hope that you will follow along that outline. I have one more message in the series that I'll bring next Sunday. But I want you to understand what we Southern Baptists believe, and we've been drawing from our Baptist faith and message, as well as uh, some other resources. And we've covered several topics And this morning, I want us to cover uh, the subject of religious liberty. Our Baptist faith and message is not a creed. It is a statement of faith. It says God alone is Lord of the conscience. And he has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are contrary to his word. The church and state should be separate. The state owes to every church protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. In providing for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than others. Just a brief synopsis of what we as Southern Baptists believe about religious liberty. Now, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good probability this morning that my, many of us present here today have heard a sermon on religious liberty. But I think it's one that is pertinent to our day and one that needs to be heard. I point you to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul was an itinerant preacher, missionary. He would travel from place to place, establish churches. But oftentimes, when he would travel to a certain city, there were Jews that would follow him there. We call them Judaizers. And they would preach a different gospel, a false gospel. They felt like to be Christian not only Did you believe and have faith in the Christ, but also you must follow the religion of Judaism? And the Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatian Christians, writes these words, chapter 5, verse 1. He knows that they've heard that talk. He writes, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us Three, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. The phrase yoke of bondage is often referred or used to refer to the law in the New Testament. Paul is saying to the, to the Christians in Galatia, the Jews do not believe in religious liberty. They want you to believe their way. There are no other way, but it's false. You are free in Christ. Do not be entangled again with the bondage or the yoke of bondage that is the law. Now, I've got to uh, give you a little bit of history this morning. I majored in history in my undergrad work. I know it can be boring. I'm going to try to move through the historical part as quickly as I can, but it's going to require that you listen carefully. So sit up a little straighter, bend your ear just a little further, and listen carefully. In the 16th century, Protestantism was born with the breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. It is called the Protestant Reformation. The non-Catholic believers then went their separate ways, many of them forming different denominations. As Southern Baptists, we find our roots in the Anabaptists. 
The prefix Anna means again. The word Baptist comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or to plunge under. While infant baptism was the acceptable mode and method of baptism, the Anabaptists had the conviction of believers' baptism and were the first to baptize adults. And for this belief and this practice, they were highly persecuted. I want you to note that religious liberty cost many believers their blood. And many of these believers were Baptist. It cost Baptist blood. In Switzerland, the Anabaptist forefathers, Felix Mance and Conrad Griebel, were imprisoned for preaching believers' baptism rather than infant baptism. Such teaching was contrary to the government-established church. With the help of friends, they were able to escape, but they resumed their work of evangelism as quickly as possible. Griebel died in his work. Mance was later captured in 1527. He was executed by drowning in the Lament River. He died for his conviction concerning baptism. In England... The first Baptist church was formed in the early 1600s. There was no religious freedom in England at the time. There was the state church of England, and the king was the head of that church. Thomas Helwes, a Baptist pastor, wrote a book in 1612 in which he asserted the doctrine of religious liberty. He sent a copy to the king of England, King James I, along with a reminder that he was not God and only God had authority over the souls of men. Helwes was arrested, imprisoned, and left to rot away his life there. Baptists and other dissenters were excluded from holding public office required to attend the services of the state Anglican church, forbidden to preach without a license. However, they did continue to preach, and they preached believers' baptism. It is estimated that during these tumultuous years, some 3,000 dissenters died in jail under the reigns of James I, and his son Charles I. It was about this time that our pilgrim fathers fled England to the New World, many of them seeking religious liberty or freedom. Among them was Roger Williams, a brilliant, highly educated Anglican preacher. However, he did not find religious freedom as he settled into the Massachusetts Bay Colony They too had a state-sanctioned church. Williams had rejected the tyranny of the ecclesiastical church in England. Why would he submit to the same in New England? He began to argue the separation of church and state. For this stand, he was threatened with deportation. And it happened to be in the winter of 1636. Ultimately, they deported him out of that colony. He found refuge with the Indians. And in the spring, Williams and friends founded Providence Plantation, which is now Rhode Island. And in this new colony, there was freedom of religion, separation of church and state. In 1639, they tell us that the first Baptist church was built in America. Well, the persecution of Baptists 
and others continued until after the American Revolution or the Revolutionary War and the adoption of the Constitution with the Bill of Rights. You know what the first Bill of Rights says. Congress will or shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. For the first time in America, religious liberty was guaranteed. Religion was no longer left to the whims of human authority. Baptist and religious groups were finally free. Now, folks, listen. One of the most cherished beliefs among Southern Baptists is religious freedom. And perhaps one of the greatest contributions Baptist has made to American society is the freedom of religion. The freedom for men and women, everyone, to worship according to the dictates of their own conscience. We believe in the separation of church and state. Whenever and wherever the church and state have been connected, people have lost their religious freedom. Did you know in 312 A.D., when Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire, was converted to Christianity, Christianity was declared to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. It seemed that it was Christianity's greatest day, but it created a union between church and state that lasted 1,500 years. You have heard it said, if power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. With the civil powers and ecclesiastical powers wed together, it was a mess. There was a time when the state even became suburban, suburban, uh, or, or, uh, subservient to the, the, uh, the church because they said the church had the authority over the souls of men. The church ran things. The church had the authority. The church had the power over all things. And nonconformity to the church meant persecution and martyrdom. Best I can tell, it was the union of religion and government that caused Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. It was the religion supported by the government that nailed Jesus to the cross and had the apostle Paul arrested and beheaded. Whenever and wherever the government has connected itself to the church, there has been greed and corruption and pain and suffering. We Baptists believe and we will die for religious freedom and the separation of church and state. That's the introduction. I got through it. Now what does it mean to have religious freedom? There's four things that I want to share with you by way of outline. Number one, we are free to choose. That's what it means. We're free to choose. Baptists believe religious freedom means freedom of religion, freedom for religion, and even freedom from religion. A person must be free to choose what they believe, whether they're Christian, whether they're Jew, whether they're Muslim, whether they're atheist, they must be free to choose without fear of reprisal. Many Baptists, as well as many Americans, have died defending that right. You may know that Islam is one of the fastest growing, or is the fastest growing religion in America today. The religion of Islam has made it very difficult for us to love them. They tell us that there is such a thing as radical Islam, but somebody, somewhere, 
needs to take a public stand and denounce what is going on by so-called radical Muslims. I've yet to hear a respected iman in America denounce the behavior of radical Islam. In fact, it is taught in their Quran to destroy the infidel, which is the non-Muslim. That means they are taught to hate and to kill Americans and especially Christians. But as Baptists, we believe even Muslims should have the right to practice their religion without reprisal, as long as it does not infringe on the lives and rights of others. A church-sponsored or a church-sponsored and interfaith council of Jewish and Christian leaders. And after a heated discussion among the panel, a Jewish rabbi spoke up saying, Now we understand what you believe about Jesus Christ and how you want us to accept him as our Messiah. But our question is, will you still love us if we don't? As Baptists, we believe in and we respect a person's right to choose what they will believe and we will expect or we will accept their choice. I read that someone, and I'm going to quote, Our stand is not just for toleration. Our stand is for liberty. Toleration and liberty are different. Toleration is a concession. Liberty is a right. Toleration is a gift from man. Liberty is a gift from God. Baptists don't believe in toleration. We believe in the right to choose what we want to believe. That principle is found all through the Scripture. Did you know that? It begins with Adam and Eve. God looked down, noticed that Adam was the only one alone. All the other animals had companions. Adam was the only one that didn't have one. So he he declared that he was going to create a companion for Adam. He came to Adam and he said, You're the greatest of my creation, so I'm going to create a companion for you. She'll worship the ground you walk on. She'll long for you and no other. She'll be highly intelligent. She'll wait on you hand and foot and obey your every commandment. And she will only cost you an arm and a leg. Adam thought for a minute and asked, what can I get for a rib? Is that how it went? No, that's not how it went. But God created Adam and his companion Eve with the freedom to choose. And they chose to disobey God. This principle also is found in Joshua chapter 25 verse 15. One day Joshua stood before the people of God and said, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then you choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served on the other side of the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He gave the people of the Old Testament, the Israelites, He gave them the freedom of choice. You say, well, preacher, you got a New Testament illustration of that point? I sure do. One day Jesus was walking down the road and a a young man, we don't know his name, we just call him the rich young ruler, he came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him what to do and he walked away and Jesus let him go. Jesus never coerced. He never bribed. He never threatened or deceived anyone. He simply made the offer clear and respected a person's freedom to choose for themselves. That's the example that we follow in evangelism. We present the offer. We respect the person's choice. No force 
No coercion, just the persuasion of love. Did you know through the centuries there was times when both Christians uh, and other religious groups sought to gain converts by force? Yeah, there were wars in order to convert people to their, to their faith. But no true Baptist would ever take that approach today. Persuade, yes. Coerce, no. The gospel is to be shared. One writer said, not shoved. Baptists believe religious freedom means the freedom to choose. You can choose for yourself. You can choose to believe. You can choose to reject the gospel. Number two, religious liberty means that we're free to worship according to our own personal conviction. No one should be able or should be made, excuse me, to worship, nor anyone forbid the opportunity to worship the God of the Bible. Powers that be attempted uh, to shut down the worship of, of the God of the Bible and other forms of worship, they, they sought to shut that down during the pandemic. Can you remember those days? Can you remember those days when they considered the liquor store a place of an essential business but not the church? You remember those days? It was an attempt to shut down the worship of God. I want to tell you, worship is at the heart of what we do in our Christian lives. Jesus said to the woman at the well, But the hour comes when true worshipers shall worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. That word seek there is a very interesting word. It's found many places in, in the Bible. It was, word, it was used by uh, Herod just after or as the Magi came for the visit. Herod said to them, seek the young child that I may worship him. It was a word that Jesus used when he spoke of the shepherd leaving the ninety and nine and seeking the lost sheep. It was the word used to describe the ministry of Jesus as it said Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. With the same passion Herod sought the Messiah, the shepherd sought the one lost sheep and Jesus seeks the lost. God seeks after people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But worship cannot be forced. Someone said the main thing God asks for is our attention. And our attention cannot be compelled. Years ago, George W. Truett was pastor of the great First Baptist Church of Dallas. He preached a sermon in 1920 on the Capitol steps in Washington, D.C. The message was entitled, Baptist and Religious Liberty. This is what he said. It is the consistent and insistent contention of our Baptist people. Religion must be voluntary and uncoerced. God wants free worshipers and no other kind. I read about a Baptist pastor who was asked his definition of worship. He replied, worship is when you exchange hearts with God. He leaves with yours and you leave with his. How can that be forced? It cannot be. Matters of the heart must be free. Man is to be free to worship according to the conviction of his own heart. Number three, we Baptists believe religious liberty means we're free to support the church of our own personal choice. The Bible teaches financial support 
of God's work is done through the church. God's people giving to and through the church of their own personal choice. Again, it's a matter of the heart. It can't be coerced. We should never be taxed to support a church that we don't agree with. When the church and the state wed together, that happens. We believe church members are to take care of the church. Tax money is to take care of the government. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that belong to God. Benjamin Franklin once stated, I judge the difference between a good religion and a bad religion. It is the bad one that needs the government to prop it up. A good one has God. Horace Greeley, the famous American editor of the 1800s, received a letter from a woman seeking help for her church. She wrote, our church is in dire financial straits. We've tried everything to keep it going. A strawberry festival, an oyster dinner, a donkey party. I don't know what that is. A donkey party and a, dinner, and a turkey dinner. Then she said, can you please tell us, Mr. Greeley, how to keep a struggling church from disbanding? Greeley wrote back saying, try Christianity. That's good advice. The work of Christ is worthy of our support and our sacrifices. We believe as Southern Baptists we should be free to support the church of our, of our choice, of our own personal conviction. And finally, we as Southern Baptists believe we are free to convert others. Religious liberty means we're free to convert others. You see, the first line of attack against religious freedom is always the point of evangelism. A fight over the propagation of faith. Religious freedom means we've got the right to preach, we've got the right to teach, we've got the right to propagate our Christian faith. According to Acts chapter 4, the powerful Sanhedrin, the high court of the Jews, ordered Peter and John not to preach or to teach or even speak the name of Jesus. But the disciples would not heed that order. I mean, they might as well have been telling the wind not to blow or the stars not to shine. You see, it was their purpose to speak Jesus. We Baptists believe that's our purpose too. I read about a barber who had just gotten saved at a revival service. The next morning at work, he wanted to share his new faith. He wanted to witness to the lost. A customer came in, sat down in his chair. He asked for a shave. The barber took out his razor, sharpened it up, and uh, as he was shaving, he was trying to muster up enough uh, gumption to uh, tell this man about his faith. And finally, when he stood over the man and he had his razor up against his throat, he asked the man, are you prepared to meet God? That may not be the time or the way to do it. But I want to tell you that's what we as Southern Baptists believe. We believe we should be able and free to tell others about Jesus. We believe every person without Christ is a mission field. And every Christian is a missionary. We believe we ought to be free to live, to preach, teach, and evangelize. Now, I've got to conclude. For Baptist, religious freedom is freedom to choose what we believe and practice. It's freedom to worship according to our own personal convictions. It's freedom to support the church of our own personal choice. 
And then finally, it is freedom to convert others. We Baptists believe in freedom. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my father died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. That's what we as Baptists believe. We believe in freedom. I read about a woman, a teacher, a preschool teacher who was teaching her young class about patriotism, independence. The 4th of July was coming up. And so she told this class, we live in a great country. And one of the things that we should be happy about is that here in our country, we're all free. A little boy got up from his seat, came up to the teacher's desk, put his hands on his hips like this and said, Teacher, I'm not free, I'm for." We Baptists believe we're free. Let freedom reign. But friend, listen. There's a silencing of the lambs today. According to the World Evangelical Encyclopedia, since the death of Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, 43 million Christians have become martyrs. Over 50% of those happened in the last century alone. More than 200 million Christians face persecution every day, and 60% of those are children. Every day, they tell us, 300 people are killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you, friend, they've not yet begun killing Christians in America but I want to tell you, they're silencing them. Football coach Joseph Kennedy of Washington State lost his job because he refused to stop praying on the 50-yard line after the ball game. It took him six years of his life, but it went all the way to the Supreme Court and he won. Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote, the majority opinion saying both the free exercise and free speech clauses of the First Amendment protect expressions like Mr. Kennedy's. A few years ago, Dr. Paul Vitz, then professor of psychology at New York University, worked with a committee that examined 60 social studies and history textbooks used in public schools across the United States, the committee was amazed to find that almost every reference to the Christian influence of early America was systematically removed. Their conclusion, the writers of the commonly used textbooks exhibited paranoia of the Christian religion and intentionally censored Christianity's positive role in American history. They're silencing the lambs. Activist judges, secularist educators, morally bankrupt entertainers, and liberal politicians have teamed up to sell a godless, critical version of America's past. Their objective is to take the presence of God, the Bible, and Christianity out of American life. The Bible, the God of the Bible, as well as Christianity, does not fit their woke culture. We cannot be silent any longer. The America that we've known is not the America that you have today. We've got to stand against this godless woke culture because this culture and the swamp in Washington are systematically taking away our religious freedoms especially they enjoy attacking the Christian 
And the reason they're taking away or attacking the Christian is because Christianity does not, let me say it again, will not fit their woke culture. God's Word, Christianity, will not fit what they believe. And all the things that they're tolerating and promoting in this culture. I read that 70% of Americans now, get that, 70% of Americans no longer believe in moral absolutes. Friend, we can be silent no longer. With voice and vote, we must stand for God. We must stand for God's word and we must stand for Christianity. Because there are those who are trying to take it away. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and I'll close with this, famously said, Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. And not to act is to act. We cannot let them silence the lambs any longer. 